Okay, well, I am Marcy Darnowski from the Center for Genetics and Society. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I'm here to welcome you tonight. And we're really excited about this conversation tonight. We think that it, we, the idea is to bring together a set of issues, a set of critically important issues that aren't often considered together and to bring together a wonderful set of speakers who aren't, haven't been on the same stage before tonight, so this is a first, and to have them help us think in smart and engaged ways about these very urgent issues. So for us at the Center for Genetics and Society, we see that both climate change and proposals to control the traits of our, of our children and future generations, that these are both connected, that these are connected to each other, and that they're both urgent challenges of social justice. But to be honest, when we came up with this idea for an event called Climate Crisis, Designer Babies, Our Common Future, we really were not sure what to expect. We, do, we didn't know if other people would see the dots that needed to be connected the way that we do. And actually what happened was that the registration started pouring in. And we got up to 400 for this 200 person room and we said, ooh, we better stop. And we put a note on the website that said, sorry, we're not gonna be able to let you in. And the registrations kept coming in. So there is interest in it and I, I'm really happy that you're all here with seats, with stickers, and that you'll be with us tonight for this conversation. So before we jump into it, um, I just want to take a very few minutes for some housekeeping details and introductions. So first, the plan for the evening. Um, we're going to begin for the first hour or so with Osagi um, offering John and Bill some questions and having them talk uh, with among themselves. And after about an hour, we're going to turn to your questions. And we're going to wrap up around 8 or shortly thereafter, not 8.30, as some of the publicity says. Um, so we are going to leave about 20, 30 minutes for questions from the audience. And there are two ways that you can submit questions. And you can do it either way at any time throughout the conversation. So the first way is the old-fashioned index cards that were on all of your seats. You can write your question on that. And um, Osagi will pause a little bit before we turn to audience questions and remind you about that and ask you to pass the index cards to the center and then we'll collect them from you, so the people on the aisles in the center, if you don't mind holding on to them for just a few minutes. The second way that you can submit questions is at any point during the conversation, you can email your questions to the Gmail address shown at the bottom of these screens. So it's CCDB1018, which stands for Climate Crisis Designer Babies October 18th <laughs> at gmail.com. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, two more logistical points. Please silence your cell phones is number one. And number two, uh, I wanted to let you know that we are recording this event and the event will be posted on the websites of the sponsoring organizations and we'll send you an email if you've registered so that you will have that URL. Okay, so now a few words about this evening's co-sponsoring organizations. The Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at UC Berkeley is the first. And the Haas Institute brings together scholars, community advocates, communicators and policymakers to identify and eliminate the barriers to an inclusive, just, and sustainable society, and to create transformative change toward a more equitable world. And we have representatives from the Haas Institute here. John is the director, Osagi is a uh, fellow, uh, a uh, professor, I'm gonna introduce them later, so I'll tell you his real title, and the chair of a research cluster from the Haas Institute and other folks in the audience. The second co-sponsoring organization is the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, whose mission is to improve the health of the most vulnerable populations in California and worldwide. And we have many thanks to give to the School of Public Health for making this wonderful room possible and for making this nice reception that we had just before we started possible. 
And the third co-sponsoring organization is the Center for Genetics and Society, my organization. And we're an independent social justice organization. We're based here in the city of Berkeley. We work to ensure an equitable future in which human genetic and reproductive technologies benefit the common good. And I invite you and um, urge you to take advantage of the many resources and riches that each of these organizations has online. So now I want to just very briefly introduce our speakers for tonight. And I'm going to start with John Powell, who is the director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society and professor of law, African American studies, and ethnic studies. And that's all here at UC Berkeley. John's writing over the years has focused on issues including structural racism and racial justice, poverty and housing, voting rights and affirmative action, spirituality and social justice, and the needs of citizens in a democratic society. His most recent book is titled Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Con Concepts of Self and Other to Build an Inclusive Society. And I wanted to add that under his leadership, the Haas Institute has organized a series of biannual conferences called Othering and Belonging, which has the wonderful tagline, advancing scholarship, narratives, movements, systems, and policies that support a more fully inclusive we. Okay. Bill McKibben is an author, an environmentalist, an activist. Early in his career, he was a staff writer for The New Yorker. And then in 1989, he wrote a book called The End of Nature, which is widely credited as the first book on global warming for, for the general public. In 2008, he, with a group of students at Middlebury College, co-founded the organization 350.org. And I think there are some folks here from 350 tonight as well. 350.org is the first global grassroots climate change movement. And it's organized 20,000 rallies in every country in the world except for North Korea. <laughs> Bill didn't personally organize all 20,000. <laughs> but Bill has been recognized for his work by the Right Livelihood Prize, the Gandhi Prize, and the Thomas Merton Prize. And he's written more than a dozen books. And the most recent, which actually was the instigating factor for tonight's conversation, is called Falter, Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out? And you'll hear more about that. Finally, I want to introduce Osagi Obasagi. And Osagi actually wears a hat for each of the three co-sponsoring organizations. <laughs> Two are part of his title at UC Berkeley. He is the Haas Distinguished Chair and Professor of Bioethics in the Joint Medical Program in the School of Public Health here at UC Berkeley. And he chairs, as I said, tried to say before, he chairs the Haas Institute's Diversity and Health Disparities Research Cluster. He is also a longtime senior fellow at the Center for Genetics and Society. His, uh, a recent book with, that he's well known for in 2013 is called Blinded by Sight, Seeing Race in the Eyes of the Blind, which describes how blind people perceive race. And just last year, I had the pleasure of working <coughs> with him on an anthology called Beyond Bioethics, Toward a New Biopolitics. And that's it. Now I have the pleasure of turning it over to Osagi, to John, to Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Marcy, for the introduction. Uh, so as, as Marcy uh, noted in her remarks, this uh, conversation starts from a unique provocation. And that's the idea that climate change and human genetic, genetic engineering seem like two separate conversations. So the former being oriented towards understanding how human behavior can lead to dire consequences for the environment, and the latter more focused on this idea of how reproductive and genetic technologies can allow scientists and, and researchers to control the traits of future, future humans. But a closer look uh, lets us, uh, allows us to see that there are, these ideas are shared by a common ideology and that both could drastically undermine our human future. 
So this discussion is really oriented towards or trying to bring attention to the role of social values and social structure in thinking through these challenges. And to show that the parameters of, discuss of the discussion is not simply about technical issues such as carbon emissions or how to edit the genome, but more fundamentally about how we treat and understand one another and the kind of future that we want to build together. So the first question uh, that I'll, ha I'll ask is for Bill. And so Bill, you're known by most people by your writing on climate change and the climate crisis. And so why did you include the idea of designer babies in your most recent book, Falter? And to those who are unfamiliar with the terms human, gen human genetic engineering and modification, can you briefly go over what that is and what challenges it poses uh, for our human future? Absolutely. First, uh, what a pleasure to be here. And so many thanks to Marcy, um, who deserves enormous credit for persevering with this question for a long time um, when it was hard to get people to pay attention. And now as finally it sort of comes to the moment when people are, it's awfully good to have you here uh, uh, ready to go. Um, and I'm very grateful for all the help over the years in thinking through these questions. Um, look, some of this, uh, uh, I mean, some of this we're talking about very locally. Some of this work that what we now call CRISPR technology was, uh, came from right nearby. Um, and it's fascinating work, uh, incredible uh, technical accomplishment that holds all kinds of promise, uh, and not at all to be um, um, dismissed. Um, the, it's probably important as one begins, since not everybody uh, knows all about this, to just make the most basic distinction uh, between what you, what you would call somatic genetic engineering and germline genetic engineering. The first is a kind of extension of medicine as we've known it. It's treating people who have uh, an illness, existing people with uh, with something that can be corrected through. And I don't personally, I mean, there's plenty of questions to be asked about the role of big pharma and how we deliver medical care and so on. But I don't see uh, philosophical dilemmas and things that arise from the idea. Germline genetic engineering is very different. It's the use of this technology to uh, improve uh, uh, human beings in embryo, uh, to produce new characteristics they would not otherwise have and ones that they will then pass on uh, yay unto the generations, as it says in the good book. And um, um, that does seem to me something that we might want to pay serious attention to. I will say, just as, just as we start, I mean, when I wrote The End of Nature in 1989, we were at the beginning of this discussion about climate change. It hadn't yet happened. We were still talking about something, sort of issuing warnings about what would happen if we didn't, well, we didn't do anything about it. We went full speed ahead, and now we're in a world where, you know, uh, to keep Northern California from burning down, we turn off the power now for you know millions of people. So and and you know that's the smallest of the inconveniences. I mean, there's other people who are already leaving the islands where they've lived for five thousand years or whatever else because of what we've done. I think one of the things we should say about germline genetic engineering is it would be good to have the conversation before, not after, we've turned the world upside down, you know. Um, um, it, it would be nice to have that conversation and to have it at least it overlap in certain ways with what we've uh, learned about climate change. A, the iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the more and sooner you suffer. The, you know, the, there are sort of a series of questions about power and things embedded in all these questions. But also a series of questions about what it means to be a human being, you know. Um, one way to think about both these things is that human beings have become extraordinarily powerful uh, in a way that they never were, at least maybe you can date it to the first explosion of the first nuclear weapon, but uh, uh, certainly our ability as a species to change 
the composition of the atmosphere and hence the temperature of the planet and hence things like the existence of ice caps or coral reefs or whatever and to do it all in the course of 30 or 40 years is a pretty remarkable extension of our power and now the possibility to change what human beings have been for as long as there have been human beings um, is a pretty remarkable uh, 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 thing to contemplate, uh, a pretty remarkable extension of our power, our size, and so we should think long and hard about it, and that's why it's so good to be having these kind of conversations now, it seems to me. Thank you. And so, John, much of your scholarly work and advocacy has focused on civil rights and civil liberties, structural racism, housing, and poverty, and as well as democracy. So how do these concerns connect with the climate crisis as well as the prospect for human genetic engineering? Well, first of all, let me join Bill in, in uh, thanking Marcy and, and Osagi and, um, and the various uh, organizations around Berkeley that's supporting this effort, and thank all of you. Um, these are really, really important issues. Uh, it's hard to imagine anything more important. And in some ways, uh, so as uh, it was suggested in terms of reading about my history, uh, when you hear all this, you know, there's all these different areas, and they may sound disparate, but really what I'm concerned about and always have been concerned about is about uh, human beings and life. Um, and so if you think about it, and I, and I focus most on people who are at the margins. Um, and I'm, I'm doing work right now, and been doing it for the last few years, uh, in Detroit around water. Mm. And a lot of people know about Flint, but Detroit, Flint was actually part of the Detroit water system. Mm. Um, and when, you, when I go to Detroit, which is the largest uh, um, black city, in the United States, although it's declining in, in population. And you say, what do you think about climate change? People's like, don't think about climate change. <laughs> but they say, what do you think about water? Then you hear a lot of expletives. Mm. Um, people think about water a lot. Literally, people are not getting water. People are dying from polluted water. Uh, people can't afford water. And when, while we talk about Detroit, we could be talking about Cape Town. We could be talking about Mexico City. In the United States, there are 740 cities in the United States that are facing uh, a water crisis. And it's sort of interesting that it shows up, and the way it shows up is that in the first instance, people see it as race. It's like, well, those black people in Detroit, they don't know how to actually manage their water. Now, the Detroit water system actually serves 40% of Michigan. It was built uh, 150 years ago. Uh, when they dug up uh, Woodward, which is the main the therophel in Detroit, uh, to repair some of the pipes, some of the pipes were made out of wood. That's how old they were. Uh, and at the time that they made those pipes, there were two black people in Detroit. Uh, probably maybe, maybe three, uh, but it, it, it wasn't a black issue. So the way society sort of organized around these issues are in racial terms. Uh, and therefore, the solution that came out of Detroit was to separate the water system in Detroit from the suburbs. So now you have and essentially the black water system in Detroit and the white water system in the suburbs, and it's the same water system. Uh, but the rates are different, the way people are treated are different. Uh, so these issues are deeply, deeply connected all the time. Uh, and as Bill suggested, um, if you look at people who are suffering the most in terms of the immediate effects, because all of us will suffer and the earth will suffer, uh, are um, not just people in Detroit, but people in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and they actually express their frustration, their, their need sometimes in terms of moving. So we now know that uh, climate refugees uh, outnumber war refugees and the number's going to keep going up. And that gets turned in terms of race. So it's like, why don't those brown and black and why don't those people stay where they, oh, wait a minute, they're underwater. Uh, uh, or they, they're, their soil is changing. Um, so to me, those issues are so intricately related. And the, one of the failures is to help people see the relationship, to help people understand the relationship. And two other things I want to say about this, and one of the reasons we can't see it in part is like Detroit, and I know I keep coming back to Detroit. I'm from Detroit, many of you may know that if you heard me talk before. Um, when issues show up in the black, brown, 
native community, uh, they're ignored. Uh, and it's only then when they migrate to the white community, it's like, oh, we have a problem. And we, use, we sometimes lose decades because we, it's again, when they show up in the black community, the native community, it's like there's something wrong with those people. We don't look at systems. Um, and the other thing, of course, uh, the Bill does a really great job in his book, um, is that in order to address Detroit or any of these problems, you need collective action. And we have an ideology that's dominant in the country and in many parts of the world, and certainly here in the Bay Area, where we have what I call progressive libertarians, uh, who don't believe in collective action. They think collective action is bad. And some of us who associate ourselves with the left or progressives fall into that same trap. Mm -hmm. I don't join groups. I'm a liberal. I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I'm a, you know, uh, and you can't address climate change. You can't address water. You can't address uh, designer babies at the individual level. Before I turn it back to you, Osagi, just uh, two other points I want to make. First of all, uh, uh, Osagi, you won't, you, he's asking questions today, but he's like one of, one of the, the people who's the most creative in terms answers. of pulling different things mm -hmm. together uh, and just we, we are really lucky to have him here uh, at Berkeley and I also want to acknowledge Denise Hurd who's my uh, um, uh, deputy director at the at the Haas Institute but I should not be here I flew in today from New York but that's not the reason I should not be here <laughs> I should be on grandfather maternity leave mm -hmm. because Monday my daughter picked up a five-week-old five baby, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I should be there helping. But I tell you that tough. because it's pretty cool, but also I talked to my daughter today and she's completely frustrated because 95% of the baby formula is toxic. Mm -hmm. And she's running around trying to get non-toxic baby formula that affects the brain and affects... This is climate change. Mm -hmm. and. Where does she, she has to go try to get European baby foam because they don't mm. let them pollute in the same way that the United States does. Mm. So this is immediate. This is not an abstract issue. This is an issue that affects all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next question is for Bill. So much of the conversation around climate change uh, focuses on these highly technical issues such as carbon emissions mm. and, the, and the rise of ocean waters. And similarly around designer babies is sim always is not, is often a technical issue about off-target target, mm -hmm. target edits and other types of, of uh, scientific topics uh, such as that. Uh, but in your new book, Falter, you focus on a key ideological challenge that animates many of these concerns. And this is this hyper-individualism that John touched upon a few minutes ago. And I I was wondering if you can elaborate more about how hyper-individualism is, is driving many of these uh, concerns. Sure. I mean, if there's been a guiding philosophy for America for a considerable while now, it's been um, you're the most important thing mm -hmm. on the planet. You yourself sitting there. That's what it means to live in a high consumer society. Um, don't don't limit yourself in any way because uh, that would be bad for the economy. Um, um, and the ultimate expression of this, uh, in many ways, would be the ability to, um, well, to purchase and design your child. Um, think about. Let's think about. And one of the great ironies of it is that this libertarian notion that one should be allowed to do it is in some ways the the most anti-individual, anti-libertarian idea there's ever been. I mean, think, there's a thousand good practical reasons that I think we'll talk about to be very wary of human genetic engineering. Uh, questions around diversity, around power, around money, around uh, things that can go wrong. Let's just put those aside for one minute and say, what if it works exactly as it should and everybody has access to it and whatever. So you go into the clinic and you plop down your $5,000 and tweak your child as best you can. You know, get all the 
best upgrades, a couple of IQ points, and uh, you know whatever it is that you're you know has been advertised for us. So we're, we're simplifying a little bit here, but this is precisely what the people who write about and fantasize about this industry talk about: selecting traits for your child, personality, demeanor, uh, uh, choosing on a spectrum that uh, you know, uh, and they're not at all fanciful to think about. We know a lot about how you control dopamine and serotonin and things now, so it's not at all implausible to think about. Okay, so you've upgraded your child. Your child emerges. You go back a couple of years, your daughter decides another, you know, second child, you know, and you go into the clinic and you plop down your $5,000 a few years later. Well, science marches on. Um, your $5,000 buys you a good deal more this time around, right? Uh, 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 some more, like whatever it is. Well, what's your first child now? Your first child now is iPhone 6, you know? Um, 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 one, of the, one, of the, one of the features of a technology is obsolescence. One of the features of human beings for a very long time has been a kind of deep connection back into time with everything that came before. We can look at, you know, cave paintings on the wall from 40,000 years ago and have some kind of reaction to them as if they're from, because they are from people more or less like us. Consider now from the point of view of the child who has been engineered. You're 12, 13, 14, you wake up some morning and you find yourself feeling unaccountably happy uh, with the world. Is this because you've, I don't know, fallen in love for the first time? Or is it because your spec is kicking in, you know, uh, 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 that you're getting the hit of whatever you've been? Well, that's a deeply new thing for humans to have to, I mean, uh, and, and it goes deeply to the question of what is a human and how do we want to uh, imagine ourselves. For me, these are the first set of sadnesses that hang over this question, just in a way, as for me, the first set of sadnesses that made me think about climate change in a deep way, mm -hmm. I mean, back at the beginning, we're not about, I mean, we didn't yet have, we could anticipate the kind of practical dangers and horrors that were coming, the people who would have to, you know, couldn't farm in Bangladesh or who would, you know, you know all those sort of things. But really, we could also anticipate the end of a kind of relationship with a world larger than us, a world that ran to some degree on its own, um, principles, a world that we could fit into instead of uh, uh, dominate. And that sadness for me was what first animated, my, it's, it's not so much what animates my work now because now we're in the thick of the fight, but it's worth, I think, trying to, to kind of um, just for a minute step far enough back to figure out uh, what we value uh, 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 about well, what we value about a child um, um, coming into the world. Um. Thank you. Uh, so this question is for John. Um, so how is climate change a racial justice issue? We talked about this a little bit earlier uh, with, uh, what's, with regards to what's happening in Detroit, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a bit more broadly about how these issues that are often thought about uh, changes to the environment may have disproportionate impact on certain populations and communities. Well, I will talk about that, um, but not right now. <laughs> uh, because I want to actually start with the disposition that actually creates the uh, supposition that we should dominate nature. Mm -hmm. uh, not simply how it affects. And I actually talk about this some in my book. Uh, because what Bill just described in terms of um, I'll be a little bit provocative, and some of you've heard me say this before. So, who is who are these people that believe 
that nature is to be dominated, that um, we're to extract stuff from the earth and then leave it, that uh, everything is, has a utility controlled by someone else, uh, and that, um, that some parts of life and people are better than um, already, before we even do any uh, uh, design, that certain people are better than other people. Uh, and I want to suggest that's the core of both what we might call the ideology of whiteness and more specifically what we call white supremacy. It's believing that certain groups of people are better than other groups of people and the people that are less than are to be exploited. And the people that are less than are oftentimes exploited in part because they're actually close to nature. Mm. So why is it that it took so long? We're just coming up on the 100th year anniversary where women got the right to vote in the United States. Why did it take so long? Because we have this whole ideology that women, while we kind of needed them, <laughs> but we couldn't trust them because they were too close to nature. Too emotional. Mm. Uh, and so those things that was considered, and I say we, not because I wasn't considered part of that we. Uh, and, it's, and, and, and it's actually very graphic when you look at it. The most, one of the most uh, infamous cases in the United States history is Dred Scott, mm. uh, which many people think led up to the Civil War and pushed us years earlier into the Civil War than we would, would have been otherwise. And the issue with Dred Scott, among other things, was could black people be part of the polity? Could black people be real citizens? Could black people belong? And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Judge Taney, said whether blacks were free or enslaved, it was inconceivable that they could be part of the polity. Inconceivable. Uh, and that no state had the power to confer upon black people the rights of federal citizenship. Uh, and in a sense, we're still fighting those battles. So that notion of the right to exploit, the right to extract, the right to dominate, is already deeply embedded in the ideology of whiteness, mm -hmm. uh, especially as expressed in America. And so the, it's, it's not surprising then that the people who actually are closest to that ideology are willing to have a very problematic relationship to nature. And one of the books I like is called Down to Earth. And mm -hmm. Arthur makes the in, uh, invocation that we should not say we're humans advocating for nature. He says it's more accurate to say we're nature advocating for nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if you accept that notion of superiority, even without design babies. We are already into uh, uh, what I would call a, a kind of racism, uh, a kind of uh, um, sexism, a kind of hostility toward nature. And you know, in some people I think it's Genesis 123. God gave man, man dominion over the earth and every living thing. Wow, what a terrible position, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so it's already there. It's already there. And then that extension. And anything then that tries to interfere with that is seen as just wrong. Uh, not just as wrong, but it's like uh, we're the best, we're the smartest. And the assumption is if I have power, if I have money, it's because I deserve it. Um, and I think we have to go beyond challenging white supremacy to challenge human supremacy. To assume that you know, that, I mean, wasn't it Galileo that got kicked out of the church for okay. 500 years because he suggested that maybe the earth Wasn't and by not, extension yeah. humans were not the center of the universe? Uh, and, and some people are reasserting that yes, we are the center of the universe and you're just here to do our bidding. Uh, and that we does not include people of color, does not include women, does not include people with disabilities, does not include nature. Uh, if you think about it, and this is all, it just runs throughout our history, the justification for taking the land from native people was that they were not using the land productively. And they, they were letting the land just exist. And it's like, that's clearly savage. 
And again, that was the Supreme Court cha case. Uh, Johnson v. Tiatak, if you want to read it. Uh, so this wasn't just some wild-eyed, crazy person. This was the court justifying. <laughs> Look at them. They're wasting all this land. We could be exploiting this land. We could be mining this land. We could be extracting this land. And so it became both an attack on the land and an attack on Native people at the same time. So those things have always been closely related. And, and I think uh, this notion of supremacy and domination uh, and separation from each other and from nature uh, runs throughout when we talk about racism, sexism, uh, uh, homophobiaism, uh, and, and more importantly, whiteness. And I always make the point that whiteness is not a, gen a biological or genetic trait. It's a psychological social trait. Uh, and we need to, and, and I say in a just world, no one would have to live their whole life uh, uh, embodied in whiteness. No, I think that that's really powerful. Um, and I think that to sort of go off the last part of that, it's, it is worth remembering that that, um, that that kind of impulse towards domination appears in a lot of places now in our world. So for instance, the first two designer children in the world were born last, last year in China. Uh, and the, the uh, Chinese seem to have adopted, that, well, at least that doctor had, but, he, but of course he was working, as it turns out, hard with a lot of Bay Area collaborators to uh, uh, accomplish what he was accomplishing. Um, and it's been good to see that there was at least, and I think Marcy and her colleagues are responsible for some of this, at least some good pushback against that as it emerged, that it kind of started to shock the conscience a little bit of, I, I think that there probably were some scientists who were beginning to say to themselves, what are we on the edge of unleashing here? Just as uh, people are beginning to understand what on earth it is we unleashed as we, um, in the developed world, dug up as much carbon as possible and burned it to get as rich as possible. And uh, uh, now, our, I mean, it's entirely true, as I said before, that the, uh, the first, I mean, I mean, this is the greatest single injustice that we've ever figured out how to do. I mean, right. I mean literally now, I mean, we, we've taken away through colonialism and you know a thousand things from people around the world, but to take away the ability to grow food on the piece of land where your ancestors grew it for the last 200 generations, I mean that's sort of the almost the last thing to take away. You know, I mean it's I mean, but as with all. Um, horrors unleashed, eventually it comes back to bite even those who uh, unleashed it. Um, you know, um, uh, it, was, um, it was remarkable last year to watch a California city literally called Paradise literally turn into hell inside half an hour, you know, um, uh, and, and, and those kind of scriptural overtones uh, date right back to Genesis right. 123 and some uh, because we didn't do we did not do what we were told in Genesis 2 we failed to dress and keep this garden that we had been given you know um, and instead um, sought to take from it everything we could and now that we're going to do the same thing with the kind of wilderness that's represented by the genome. Um, uh, uh, I mean, the, the eventual biting back here will be when we realize that whatever we are, we're not sort of human exactly anymore at the end of it. Uh, and that will be a profound, I think, moment of reckoning for everyone if indeed we're still sort of in the business of reckoning anything, you know, um, um, if we still have, 
if we still have that, if, if, our, if our serotonin hasn't been turned up so high that we're just pleased with whatever's going on. I, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But. Well, Saki, if I could just add to that. I mean, think you get this, I mean, the examples are replete once we start looking for them. Um, so think about enslaved black women. Uh, the United States slave trade was that it ended uh, in 1806. The no, no more slaves were supposed to, enslaved people were supposed to be brought to the United States. So what do we do? So women, black women became uh, cattle. They became, um, they literally, black women was, the job was to produce babies to be slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, and the babies could be by white men or black men, it didn't matter. But they were, they were to produce babies not to live their lives, but to be enslaved. And then later, they decided, okay, maybe we have enough black people. So they start sterilizing black women, saying you can't have kids anymore. And they didn't just limit it to black women. They said, okay, if you got some quote unquote defect called a disability, you shouldn't have any offspring. So we start sterilizing women who were disabled. Uh, and I just came from New York, and I was meeting with, um, among other things, Alexis McGill, who's head of Planned Parenthood and Reproductive Justice. And today, there are 75 lawsuits trying to hold on to the women's right to control their body. There's this attack, right? So this is the same notion that somebody, usually men, feel like they have the right not just to control their own body, not just to control what they think and do, but they control everybody. Um, and they're using, willing to use the courts and guns and laws uh, to make this happen. So this right to control, right to dominate, uh, extends across nature, extends across people, extends, and it's so closely related between how we think about race, how we think about the other, uh, who belongs, who's in the we, uh, and who's not. And we certainly don't include certain people in the we, we don't include nature in the we. Yes. Nature's just there to be exploited. Yeah. And when it's completely exploited, we'll go to Mars <laughs> and start all over again. And that's, and that's, that's no joke. It's worth noting that the one common denominator between all the richest people on Earth right now is that they're building rocket ships. Okay, I mean, th I mean, literally, that's their. I mean, one does from time to time think we might be better off if they departed, but it's a you know, um, uh, that's the end game, you know. So I guess we'll remind folks uh, that we will start the question and answer session in, in a few minutes. So um, you have in index cards in your seats, so jot down questions and move those cards to the middle and someone will come by and pick them up. And we also have the opportunity to email questions in at the address on the screen. Um, so Bill, in, in Falter, you make a really interesting ideological and political connection between climate deniers like the Koch brothers and um, transhumanists who are, you know, it's a group of people who want to use technology for extreme purposes such as radical life extension and uh, enhanced intelligence. So how do these two worldviews connect in terms of the climate deniers and these transhumanists? Well, this goes back to some of this question that we were discussing before about individualism. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I try to do in the book, and I've got to say it was the most uh, painful part of the uh, writing for the book, was really spend a lot of time thinking about someone who I think it turns out to be one of the most important political figures in, uh, uh, in recent history, Ayn Rand, um, who I think you can make an argument may be the most important, if most malevolent, uh, political philosopher of our time, her, her basic credo is, you're not the boss of me, you know, don't tell me what to, no one should tell anyone what to do, be as selfish as possible, okay? That's a, uh, uh, th that's A, not a caricature in any way of her thinking, it's exactly what she kept saying, and B, it's basically been our political credo uh, in this country, uh, at least since Reagan, um, um, that's 
what it's about, you know? Uh, collective action, the government, uh, that's the problem, not the solution. Do what you want. And so you see that with the Koch brothers who want no one, you know, I mean, no one infringing on their right to uh, 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 pollute the world at, as much as they want, you know, they and their uh, many, many kindred billionaires now around the country who are part of this same network. There's a guy I describe in the book who, uh, uh, one of their big funders who's done an immense amount of damage in Michigan, who in part was motivated by the fact that the EPA came down on him. He got mad because they, uh, they wouldn't let him sell uh, arsenic tainted mulch for use in playgrounds, okay? I mean, so, I mean, don't be the boss of me. Well, so you go to Silicon Valley and they seem not at all like the Koch brothers, you know? They're all, everybody's driving Teslas and going kite sailing on the weekend and, you know, whatever it is. But they're absolutely in the same place about not wanting anyone to get in the way. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the guy who started Uber, Travis, whatever his name was, literally had, you know, Ayn Rand's book cover as his avatar on Twitter, all, you know, one after another. Uh, uh, I mean, that's, the, that's th their hatred of the idea that anyone might get in the way of their disruption of things is, I mean, and, and, and look at the results. I mean, if there's a uh, you know analog in the um, in the kind of political world to what happened with uh, climate change and the kind of pollution of, of the most fundamental in the political world the the incredible pollution of our minds our political by the kind of constant endless iteration of lies and nonsense across Facebook and whatever is is the perfect analog and you know I mean right through today Mark Zuckerberg is you know denouncing anybody's attempt to in any way control uh, the endless spewing of, of whatever you want because well because in the end you know he's made tens of billions of dollars doing it so how could it be wrong you know um, um, that kind of uh, 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 that kind of entitlement to you know to be allowed to do anything you want it, it was argued for by people like Rand on on not only on philosophical but on utilitarian grounds. This was the way and you know and people like Milton Friedman whatever. This was the way you would grow the economy fastest and. Perhaps in that, at least in the short run, they were right. If you take off all limits on behavior, all attempts to regulate, whatever, at least for a little while, things get very large, you know? If that's your only goal, at least for a little while, that's probably what to do. But it turns out that, I mean, it turns out that if your philosophical system melts the polar ice caps, that's a bad sign, okay? That perhaps you need a different philosophical system. And I think at this point, every possible amber light is flashing. But that's why it's so important to have this discussion around things like designer babies now, because that's the ultimate expression of this. And interestingly, and this goes to what you were saying about uh, libertarian, progressive libertarians and things, uh, there are people who say, plenty of people who say, don't tell me what to do with my Kid, you know, uh, 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 it's my baby. Don't and, and many of them are progressive. Don't interfere. You know, I just want to do what I want to do. Okay, just let it be said. And I was sort of was saying this before. Even if you are a arch libertarian, no one ever thought of anything less libertarian to do than exert extraordinary control over what your offspring will do, feel, think, be, look like, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's, you know, no, you know, no king has that kind of control over their subjects, you know. Um, um, so these questions around, uh, uh, around control and, and power and, and, and individualism are at the heart of, I think, both these crises. John, did you have thoughts on this? Sure. <laughs> um, 
You know, the, the, uh, I, I, I talk about in my book about Hobbes, and it's sort of interesting because someone asked Hobbes the question, can someone have complete control to be able to do whatever he wants to? And it was he, it wasn't he or she, it was just he. Uh, and Hobbes said, yes, one person. Mm. That is, only one person could have the power to do whatever that person wanted to, and everybody else becomes subjugated to that person. Uh, and uh, of course, part of what Bill is suggesting uh, is that we're deeply, deeply interrelated. Uh, that if I burn coal on my land mm -hmm. and you live next door, it affects your lungs. Mm -hmm. um, if, if uh, uh, and when I throw plastic in the ocean, uh, it doesn't stay in my ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, the whales, the dolphins, uh, the things that we live with and things that depend on uh, that our lives depend on. So the, 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 the sort of inconsistency uh, uh, of the libertarian and, and sort of weak right. intellectual greed mm -hmm. uh, that runs through, I mean it's easy to sort of attack the Koch brothers uh, and although they were extremely effective and then one question is why were they so effective and it was deliberate. It wasn't just accidental. I mean, they, they try some things, they fail, they try mm -hmm. some things. They wanted no government taxing them, they wanted no government regulations. Um, and, and it was an ideology that they were deeply embedded in, uh, and they spent billions perfecting it. Um, and then we have a different version of it here in the Bay Area, um, where people are constantly basically saying, I don't want anyone telling me what to do, I don't want anyone telling me what to try, I don't want, you know, if I don't want to wear a seatbelt, that's fine. Uh, and so, um, and in the United States context, it's profoundly tied up with race, profoundly. Uh, the United States is <coughs> exceptional and it's extreme individualism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exceptional. And if you trace the history of that, because there's a period where people of European descent and people of African descent made common cause. They lived together, they had children together, they fought <coughs> against the elites together. Uh, and the elites decided that's not a good thing. We don't want these people together, so let's separate them. And the whiteness that came out of that was really the middle stratum. It's like, okay, you're not enslaved anymore. And in fact, you have a new job, and there's two primary functions of your job. One of them is to police your black brothers and sisters that yesterday you made common cause with them, and they created the, the, uh, the slave patrol. And you were drafted into patrolling those people who literally a few days ago were part of your tribe. And the other was allegiance to the elites. Uh, and so I try to remind people that whiteness in the, in the United States was not the top of the heat, it was actually the middle stratum in service of the elites. And that's exactly what the Koch brothers have been able to do. Yep. Uh, and uh, they, they keep sort of, and that's what's so insidious. Uh, about, and what you get is you get anxiety, you get Trumpism, Trumpism. you get guns. I mean, last thing I said about Hobbes now, most of you probably didn't read Hobbes this morning. Uh, that's understandable. Hobbes, Hobbes' idea was that in the state of nature, we were in a constant war of everybody against everybody. Because his idea of people left to their own devices, they would just kill each other. He, didn't, he had no idea of how did, in hunter-gatherer society, people did not kill each other. But that's, you know, it was counterfactual. In a state of nature, we all kill each other. So we come into a society for the purpose not to be solidarity, not to have belonging, not to connect to each other, but to protect our stuff from our each stuff. other. Our government's <laughs> role is to protect our stuff from each other. I know you're after my stuff, so I'm going to get government to stop you. Mm -hmm. But then Hobbes said, but wait, we can't trust government. <laughs> Who's going to protect us from government that's supposed to be protecting us from the other person? And out of that comes the idea of guns. Mm. So. We need guns to protect us, not just from each other, but to protect us from government. Mm -hmm. And think about this, in the United States, outside of the military and outside of the police, uh, and the, the, the rapid expansion of guns happened after the Civil War. 
You got a lot of black people wandering around now who are no longer enslaved. Oh shit, we better get guns. Uh, we, meaning white people. And there are 400 million guns outside of the military and outside of police in the United States today. Uh, people trying to protect themselves. It's not working out so well. Bill, did you have anything to add? No, that's okay. nothing to add to that. Right. Okay. <laughs> and I, I really want to encourage uh, folks to check out John's work on othering and belonging that really explores these ideas in more depth. It's a, it's a really interesting way to think about the arrangements that we have in society right now. Um, so, uh, Bill, in your book, Falter, you talk about the, uh, this idea of leverage or the mm. ability to kind of fundamentally alter, and, or fun, I should say fundamentally and permanently alter the way that, uh, the way excuse me, fundamentally and permanently alter the world in ways that cannot be changed. Um, so I was wondering if you could describe this idea. And moreover, how does leverage, in a sense, lock in inequality? Mm. And do you see any similar dynamics uh, between the concerns around climate change and those in CRISP, with CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing with regards to leverage being a, a way to frame the way that inequality gets locked in? Sure. Well, I mean, let's first just say we live in a time of enormous <coughs> leverage. Uh, um, because because there's a lot of us, but mostly because we live at uh, you know a, a, a level that consumes and uses an immense amount of stuff. Again, noting the we that uh, John's been noting. Um, um, it was literally impossible for people to change the world until fairly recently because the world was much bigger than we were. Um, you could pollute wherever you happened to be, but you had no way to melt the ice caps in the Arctic. You had no way to change the chemical composition of the atmosphere. There were, there, as John has pointed out, there were an endless and ingenious number of ways to uh, uh, oppress other people and hold them down, but no one had actually invented a way to make that permanent mm -hmm. until one figured out how to uh, start um, playing around with uh, uh, genetic modification that would be inherited uh, forever, you know. Um, and by the way, I mean, we're not, I mean, this is not like some set of fantasies that people outside the, uh, you know, uh, have the guy, uh, one of the first books I ever read about this many years ago was by one a guy who was then a may still be a professor at Princeton, uh, a guy named Lee Silver, and who also now runs one of the most Im biggest gene. What's the name of his company? Of Gene Peaks. Gene Peaks. So, in his book, he makes no attempt to argue that somehow this sort of technology will be available equally to, I mean, to his credit, he doesn't even pretend that there's any chance that we will, and why would you? I mean, we live in a world where, you know, in a country, the richest country in the world, but, you know, large sections of it can't even, you know, get dental care. So why would we think that we were going to make, you know, gene imp improvement widely available? So he says, well, you know, here's what's going to happen. Just let's be serious here. Uh, uh, before very long, uh, after a few generations of doing this, we'll have two species of people, the gene rich and the naturals, and they won't be able to mate anymore. Okay. Um, that's a pretty extreme version of the things that John's been calling our attention to. And this is this is not someone who's opposed to this technology. This is someone who's going to try and make endless amount of money off it. Okay, he, But he understands uh, precisely where it's going. Um, there's That lock-in is precisely why we should think about this first. And you can see what happens if you don't think about things in time by looking at climate change? Um, because we're now locked into a lot of things. We don't, I mean, there are, there remain some, there remains, I don't want to be despairing completely about climate change, though it's a pretty desperate moment. There remain things that we must do, and I've spent my life doing them, trying to, you know, make those fights. But let's be clear, we've already locked in deep, 
permanent change. This is already by far the largest thing that human beings have ever done, and it will be read in the geological record for millions of years to come, uh, what we've done already, you know? Um, um, so uh, when you live at a moment of leverage like that, you've got to be a lot more careful. Uh, it was memorably Oppenheimer at the explosion of the first bomb at Alamogordo who looked up and quoted from the, from the Hindu scripture, from the Gita, said, we are become as God's destroyers of worlds. Well, you know, uh, we were able, because the human imagination at work is a powerful thing, we were able to imagine the effect of mushroom clouds over cities well enough that so far we've avoided repeating what we did at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The next the next year seems like it, we may be going to test some of that, you know. But the human imagination so far was was not capable of understanding that the explosion of a billion pistons inside a billion cylinders could cause the same kind of damage. But it could. We melted the ice caps. The human imagination so far is not yet, I think, capable of understanding that. CRISPR technology used unwisely is capable of remaking human beings into something else. Um, we better get our imaginations in gear because we live in a moment of great leverage and we, the people of this time and place, and especially the, the we that that John is describing are going to make a lot of these choices and and very very fast like climate change we have 10 years of leverage left or so the scientists tell us uh, and you know with germline genetic engineering we're obviously tiptoeing up to the line and the Chinese went across it you know last last autumn so leverage is a, probably a key word right and John do you have thoughts on this idea of locking in inequality I do. Um, so a couple of things. So in his book, Bill makes the uh, observation that 70% um, of Americans believe that climate change is real. So you would think in a democracy, if you had 70% of the people saying something was a problem, there'd be action. Mm. Uh, after Parkland, in terms of the mass shootings, I think the number was even higher, mm -hmm. where something like 80% of Americans thought that uh, <coughs> sensible background checks made sense. Never even got a vote. Out of, out of, yeah, never even got a vote. So when we talk about leverage, we have to, and I'll just say, you know, when I was reading Bill's book, I said, this is a great book. It is so depressing. <laughs> 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 Maybe I should go to the end and see what the, what the happy ending is. <laughs> I think that's the next book. Um, so the thing is, what do we need to do? How do we actually exercise leverage ourselves? Uh, right. And we make a mistake uh, that in a, in a democracy, plus, first of all, we assume we have a democracy, that the majority actually will carry the day. That's right. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. Um, why doesn't it happen? And how do we actually understand power to move things. Um, and uh, a friend uh, down in Stanford named Doug McAdams writes about this. He says, if you look at the democracies and study them, you find out it's the people who are best organized who actually move to mm -hmm. democracy. And they, and they can be best organized in terms of money, or best organized in terms of people, or both. Uh, again, money in a way is collective action in of itself. Mm -hmm. If you're a billionaire, that's already leverage for collective action. Uh, most of us, probably none of us, don't have a billion dollars. What we have is each other. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the, here's the rub. If we have each other, and if we can actually make government really work for us, we're never going to get 100%. So it's not going to be like you're going to sit down and have a rational conversation uh, with Exxon about climate change. Because Exxon, again, Bill talks about this in his book, Exxon knew before we knew <laughs> that climate change was real. But by some accounts, there's somewhere about $80 trillion worth of fossil fuel still buried. 
And so they have a different strategy. Okay, we're going to mess up the earth. We're going to take the $80 trillion, and we have all these different escape outs. You know, move up to the top of the mountain, buy an island, leave the planet, buy suckers. <laughs> you know? uh, and so it seems to me that in terms of getting control, we have to have a way of doing that. And I say that because even those of us who are considered, consider ourselves the left, have bought into the ideology mm -hmm. that we can't trust government and we can't engage in collective action. There's no way that we can actually address climate change. There's no way that we can actually address the oil industry. Uh, there's no way that we can address the gun industry uh, without collective action and without an effective government. Uh, so we have to actually move beyond just sort of uh, and, and what we know is that millennials, which are now larger than baby boomers, so those are the two largest age groups in the United States, millennials are larger. They protest and don't vote. Baby boomers vote but don't protest. <laughs> baby boomers win. Hmm. So we have to have a different strategy for mm -hmm. exercise and leverage to actually get this job done. Mm -hmm. cool. I think that that's absolutely right. And I, w one way to sort of say that is um, the thing that Exxon would most like people to believe is if there's a problem with the climate, the solution is for each of you slowly to change your habits. It's your fault, you know, go at it. Recycle. Um, right. And I mean, it's a very good idea to recycle. And my house is covered with solar panels and I'm, but I do not try to convince myself, fool myself that that's how we're going to deal with this problem. Uh, climate change has reached the point where you can't deal with it one Prius at a time, okay? Um, the most important thing that an individual can do in a sense is be somewhat less of an individual and join together in the movements that offer some hope for reshaping the basic economic and political ground rules. And that's, you know, that's hard and that's also possible. And there are reasons for hope at the moment. I mean, it was, I've spent much of the last stretch helping organize these climate strikes um, uh, that we saw in September with seven million people in the street and it was great fun to get to work, get to know a little bit and work with people like Greta Thunberg and all the young people around the world who have been just doing, there are, there are 10,000 Gretas around the planet doing fantastic work. Uh, extraordinary number of them from indigenous communities, from frontline communities, various kinds. It's really fun to watch. Um, so that's good. There's also something mildly undignified about taking the largest problem that's ever existed on the planet and assigning it to junior high school students you know, to solve. So uh, it would be good for everybody to get in gear. I would just want to say one real tribute to the people in the uh, uh, UC system who worked for a very long time and a month ago won a great victory when uh, the UC system divested its holdings in uh, fossil fuels much as it did in apartheid South Africa a, a generation before. Um, thank you so much to people who worked for that. It meant a huge amount. Great. Well, thank you. So I think this is a good place to end this conversation and to start a new one. Uh, so this is how this is going to work, is that uh, we've had folks who have been collecting questions from you all, both online and in cards, and they have been emailing them to me. <laughs> so I'm going to check my email and start reading questions. Uh, here's a part of it. Okay. So first question, uh, what are some preliminary policy recommendations to ensure CRISPR-Cas9 doesn't further health inequities due to race and social and social economic status, excuse me. Well, if you ask me, I think actually this is, I mean, I think we sort of know where to draw the line, at least for now. And I mean, literally, it's you draw the line at the germ line for now, it seems to me, and mm -hmm. say, don't make uh, heritable genetic modifications in embryo. Don't do it. Um, um, you can go up to that line, uh, and we can, there can be long, important ethical discussions about how to do it, what to do short of that line, how to do it. But 
until wiser minds than ours evolve, uh, I think we'd be uh, very wise to stay short of that actual line. It, it, there's, you know, draw a line in the gene as it were. So. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I worry though because um, um, don't think it'll work. Mm. Uh, I mean, once something is there, it's not just the Chinese, right? It's like once something is there, the temptations to do it and the incentive to do it, um, you know, I mean, you just, just look at the what's happening here at Berkeley and around the country where parents are cheating right. to get their kids in good schools. Mm -hmm. right. So if you're a billionaire parent and let's say you have a, a, um, a son or daughter that's who has an IQ of the greatest genius in the world, Donald Trump. You might say, <laughs> yeah, 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 let's do yeah. something. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so I think we have to actually do have to draw that line. We also have to change the incentive structure. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that happens in terms of education and other things is we create the scarcity model. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that if you're the smartest, if you're this, then you get to collect all the stuff in opposition to everyone else. Uh, and I'm on, a, I'm on a lot of these um, committees that like the future of work. And there's always a question about, well, if we don't need all these people to work uh, because of the robots, then what are we going to do with the people? I think the wrong question. Uh, if robots are creating wealth, who's the, who does wealth belong to? Mm -hmm. And I make two assertions. All wealth is commonwealth. <coughs> Say that again. All wealth is commonwealth. Uh, now how we distribute that wealth, what we do with it, it should be a collective decision. Uh, and we shouldn't decide because I have a robot and the robot did something, <laughs> and whatever the robot creates is mine. The same in terms of quote unquote intelligence. And then the question, the provocative question I ask is if, if we do have robots, and there's just a, something in the paper today that baristas in the Bay Area will soon be robots. There's already one in San Francisco. So you, you get your coffee served you buy a robot. Uh, but I also ask the question, if robots are black and white, and male and female, would it be paid the same? <laughs> <laughs> just asking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a robotic coffee machine on this first floor of this building, um, and I've been raising that the ethical issues around that with my students for the past year or so, and so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so we have two questions that are similar, so I'll read them at the same time and we can uh, dive in. So uh, the first question is, what promises and challenges do you see for the potential use of genetic editing technology for the adap adaptation of humans to climate change? And then the second question in a similar vein is, uh, there seems to be some real resonances between geoengineering solutions to climate change and engineered babies. Can you speak to this? Sure. I, you want me to take this first? You want well, to go first? Let me, let me, you do let me it. pony it up and then hand it yeah. off to you. Um, the first question, uh, using genetic engineering to adapt to climate change, not going to happen. Uh, first of all, some people will do that, but that we will be very small. And uh, again, I keep referring to Bill's book. So one, one imagined solution is like, we will science our way out of this. You know, and I would also invite you to read Harari's book if you haven't already read it. Mm. Uh, he, he says, okay, so we're talking about two, maybe three different species. So you have natural humans, then you have enhanced humans, <coughs> and then you have robots. Do we think they're going to all get together, get along harmoniously? <laughs> and Harari suggests, he says, how will robots and even enhanced humans that are more intelligent and more powerful and live longer than natural humans, how would they relate to natural humans? And he says, if you want to get a, an idea, look at how humans relate to other animals. Uh, um, there's, it's, there's nothing to suggest that that's going to be equitable, that that's going to be fair, that that's going to be humane. Uh, so the idea that we're going to let the earth go, excuse my French, to shit, uh, but we'll have people who can live in the shithole. Uh, um, another book I recommend is called The Three-Body Problem. It's written by a Chinese mm -hmm. uh, science yeah, fiction writer. And there's one scene in, the, in, the, in one of his books, it's a trilogy, where the elites are trying to figure out how to leave the planet. And it's only, they only have a spaceship big enough to take a few people. 
And again, Bill sort of addresses this in his book. Not everybody's going to go. They're not talking about seven billion people in hands. Uh, they're talking about a select few. Many of them live down in Silicon Valley or in Texas where they do oil. They're not talking about us. So I don't think it's a real solution. I don't think it's a, a healthy solution. And it still has this sort of extreme break with nature. It's like we can conquer nature, but we can enhance ourselves to deal with the fact that nature is no longer supporting us. So to me, it's just extremely problematic. So check this out. Um, the, there's one guy that I write about in this book. How do you say his last name? Savalescu, Salavescu, something. Julian from Oxford. Who, his thing about how we're going to adapt uh, uh, human beings, uh, genetically engineer them to deal with climate change is uh, so human beings can't figure out these problems on their own. Democracy, you know, won't work, whatever. So we're going to breed uh, genetically engineered children to have a lot of uh, compassion. And then they will grow up and pass the necessary laws to deal with climate change. Well, I mean, laying aside the, the, dis the distinct practical problem that this, you know, by the time this race of, uh, 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 you know, wonderkind have uh, reached the age where they're, you know, enacting these things, the planet will already be four degrees warmer. Just lay aside the practical problem, which does not somehow seem to have occurred to this Oxfordian uh, in his work. I mean, just think about sort of what that says about uh, his understanding of who we are, which is a species not in any way good enough to deal with the problems facing us. There's a kind of, um, there's a kind of horrible uh, uh, dislike of human beings at the core of a lot of this work. And of course, there are reasons to dislike human beings. There are parts of us that, are, but there also are, there are very good things about human beings. I mean, uh, we're funny and kind and often and you know, uh, and, and and worth. We should we should be willing to defend our worth as a species and to demonstrate our ability to uh, solve the problems that are before us, and and the point. And this goes directly to the point that you made before. The problem, the reason we're not solving climate change, is not because there aren't enough people who care about this and would like to solve it. Seventy percent of people would. I mean. Uh, 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 if you, you know, if there were any people on Earth that one sort of hoped you could retroactively genetically engineer, it would be people like the Koch brothers, you know, who who uh, do have something. Something has slipped in their, uh, you know, uh, uh, humanity to the point where their uh, their selfishness is so deep that it threatens all of us. But I do not think we should try to retroactively genetically engineer them. I think we should build big movements that stop them from doing what they're doing. Uh, you know, we're getting ready as the spring comes on to launch. I just had a piece in The New Yorker about the way that the biggest financial institutions in the world are deeply implicated in uh, the funding of the ongoing destruction of the planet, uh, we're going to do our best to take on Chase and City and, and BlackRock and the kind of heart of global capital. And we'll see. We'll see if we're capable of doing this. I, look, the two great technologies of the 20th century were solar panels and nonviolent social movements. Uh, and, and the two of those things offer us some hope of being able to deal with these problems. But none of it happens by itself. It's collective action that is required. And it's possible. It's not guaranteed. That's what's that's one of the things that's nice about the human condition that we're now in. Nothing is guaranteed. We get to figure it out for ourselves. And if you could build a race of robots that didn't ever pollute the world or cause trouble or whatever else, and they replaced us, that would be, um, on balance to me, an enormous loss. Um, because what would be the point? The game that we've been 
trying to play for 10,000 years would be over. Um, and it would, you know, I mean, literally, it, it seems to me it would be game over. And that's our job to avoid. Our only, you know, our, our, our job is to keep the game going. And if it has, it doesn't have an end, it seems to me, the human game. There's no end point that we're headed for. But there is a, a kind of aesthetic to that game, and it's to try and increase the amount of dignity in the world. The, the, that's how you tell if you're playing it well. And at the moment, we're definitely not. So, so before we go to the next question, I just want to do one provocation. So I, um, I'm not a humanist. So there's a game, but I don't think it's a game of just humans. We share the earth mm. with thousands of other species. So this isn't, isn't just about us. That's right. Uh, we have to, we're in relationship with them in some profound ways. Sometimes we don't like it. Uh, but to me, if we, if we manage to, man to maintain humans and let everything else die, or kill everything else, not let it die, kill it. That's what it is. Uh, to me, it's still a sort of a very sad world. And there are literally half as many animals on this planet as there were in 1970. So we're exactly halfway to the end of that project. So, so this is a question that we've touched, about, touched upon for the past uh, hour and a half or so, but I think it's useful to have an explicit conversation. And the question is, what's the relationship between designer babies and eugenic thinking? Very close. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, it, it is. I mean, it's the idea that uh, you're designing a super race, and it's, it, you know, with with them, uh, and especially in this environment. I mean, who's going to make those decisions? Who's going to have the money? Mm -hmm. uh, there already, th there's already implicit in uh, the assumption that if you're rich, you're smart, and if you're smart, you deserve it. Um, and, and and people may have cleaned it up a little bit, so they don't say it in terms of racial terms or whatever. But it's a very similar mindset mm -hmm. that some people are deserving, some people belong, and some are surplus. We don't need them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> uh, and some people are some people actually come very close to saying that. Some people are smart enough not to say mm -hmm. it, uh, but it's right there. Um, I remember being in a discussion with someone about the, the distribution of wealth in the world. And, and someone argued that, that we shouldn't be taking rich people's money from them because they had worked to earn it. So here, let me give you two things. If you made $5,000 a day and didn't mm -hmm. spend one penny of it, and you started that practice when Christopher Columbia got lost, uh, trying to find the new world, you, you still wouldn't be a billionaire. You still would not have a billion dollars. The second is, I said to this person, so you're saying people who have a billion dollars, they worked hard and made it. They deserve it. I said, yes. And I said, so you're saying that Bill Gates has worked harder than 37 million black people combined because he has more wealth. This one person mm -hmm. has more wealth than all the black people in the United States. Are you really saying? I, 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 get, I believe he worked hard. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the ideology mm -hmm. that if you're rich uh, and you're smart, I think that's one of the things that we, that people who organize around Trump, he must be smart because he's a billionaire. Uh, and uh, anyway, <laughs> amen. You just want to add to that? No, I just not add. Okay. Okay. So we're. we're second, I want a second to that. You want a second? <laughs> so we're just about at time, uh, at our time. And so for our last question, um, someone asks, "Are there any signs of hope?" So we all know very. We're, we are all very familiar with how bad it is, um, and. How can things not be so hopeless, or what can we do to change? Or are, are there positive signs of hope that change will occur? Well, you know, I, um, things are not always a straight line. Uh, their, their efforts, we live here in California. California is trying, um, uh, you know, we have higher uh, EPA standards than, as you know, the federal government that Trump is now talking about suing California to reduce our. EPA standards, um, uh, but I, th I think you know there's a, there's a tension 
because sometimes people think you generate hope by giving people good news. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you tell people things are bad, they, you just depress them and it's, it's not a recipe for action. And we need action. Uh, but the climate extension people are actually uh, generating movement by actually sharing people. But you have to give people something then to do. Something, it's like, okay, then what? Um, and I think the then what has to be willing to be fairly radical. Because sometimes we're hemmed in by, we get, we're willing to make change, but we're not willing to, uh, again, Bill, I love the fact that uh, a lot of economists will say, well, we're willing to make change, but we can't slow down a, G, uh, a gross uh, national product. In other words, we still have to grow at exactly the same rate. Uh, we still have to have as many cars on the road. We still have to, you know, and, and so all the things that are already in place hem us in. We have to be willing to radically shift that. Um, and I think people are. Um, and I think uh, people are willing to do that. But we have to have imagination. We have to have collective action. We have to reclaim government and dis insist that government works for us. Um, this is not a political ad, but uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, when he ran for president in 2016, they attacked him over and over and over again because he's a socialist. He's a socialist. Uh, today, especially among millennials, uh, more oh, people right. identify as being socialist and capitalist. Uh, that's actually amazing in a very short period of time. Uh, and socialism, in, among other things, suggests kind of a collective action. We need to harness that. So I think that um, there's some opportunity there. And I'll just end by saying, <coughs> hope, I'm not buying it, but neither am I buying despair. Mm we got to engage and act. Mm. Uh, we don't know if we're going to win this game. Mm. We don't know if we're going to be around. But if we don't show up, we definitely won't mm -hmm. be around. Uh, so I really want to encourage us to get active, to get engaged, and to be willing to th and, and think, use the big brains that we have uh, to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and there's a sense in which the things that we're dealing with now are kind of a question of whether the big brain was a good adaptation or not. You know, it can clearly get us in a lot of trouble. Can it? And my suspicion is that it may have more to do with whether we have big hearts or not that mm -hmm. get us out of that trouble. Um, um, yeah, there's reasons for hope. I mean, look, we, we've uh, let's talk about different kind of engineers, not genetic engineers, but uh, 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 you know, the engineers who've been building solar panels and wind turbines have dropped the price of them 90 percent in the last decade. That's an incredible gift. Uh, that means that if we wanted to make rapid progress on climate change, we could. We can't solve it at this point. We can't stop it, but we may be able to stop it short of, uh, you know cutting civilization off at the knees if we work really hard. Uh, and if we do it around the world, as Tom Atanadio in the back of the room has pointed out powerfully again and again. Um, um, that's, I mean, so that's hopeful if, as you say, we then decide to act on it. Um, uh, that's the question. And it's not like humans have not faced deep existential threats before. I mean, our parents or grandparents' generation faced the threat of fascism in Europe. And people had to cross the Atlantic and either kill or be killed in order to deal with it. And we don't have to do that. I mean, you know, no one is asking you to go, you know, shoot someone in order to uh, uh, get renewable energy built, um, just the opposite. We need to work together in a broad global cooperation to get something done. Um, um, that's the challenge for our time. But it ha we have to engage at the same kind of level. I mean, we have to really engage. The planet is way outside its comfort zone. So it's time for us to be outside our comfort zones, not just doing the obvious easy things, but doing the hard things that movements demand. Um, and, and the other thing that we have to do is actually do the hard work of thinking. That's what the work, that's where we are right now around these questions of genetic engineering. It's a question of not ignoring something until it's past the point where we can't do anything about it. It's the question of harnessing our imaginations 
which are the best thing about us in a lot of ways, our, our ability to, to, to imagine things, um, in order to work through the implications of this, in order to think about what it would mean to engineer a child, you know? Um, um, and it's no accident that the people who are doing the best job of this are science fiction writers. They're almost the only people in our society who have the job of figuring out the, the relationship between technological change and individual human characters, people. And it's no wonder that science fiction went from being, you know, kind of Buck Rogers, gee whiz kind of stuff to being the most dystopian, you know, part of the bookstore because these technologies are too big. They overwhelm human beings, you know. Uh, 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 the, the, the ability to have a character who has, is a recognizable human being begins to, uh, it, 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 you know, in, in those kind of tellings, they exist only in resistance to these kind of dominating technologies. So there's hope for the moment. That's where I want to end by reminding us that neither of these are problems like the kind of problems that we're used to dealing with where you get to just keep coming back at them over and over and over again. We've got lots of difficult problems like that. Donald Trump tries to take away everybody's health care. Uh, and so people suffer and die and go bankrupt, and that's terrible. But it doesn't mean that at the end, you know, when reason returns to our political life, it will be impossible to pass health care like every other industrialized country in the world has. Eventually, we will. Climate change and the germline are not like that. There are tipping points past which we go where there won't be uh, an ability any longer to deal with. No one has a no one has a prescription for how you refreeze the Arctic once you've melted it, you know. Um, 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 and so these are time-limited problems that demand our attention now precisely because they ratchet in only one direction. And that's why it seems, you know, I mean, I did not grow up with the expectation that I was going to be fairly routinely landing in jail. You know, that was not part of my life plan. Um, um, but it seems to be where uh, occasionally I end up now because these things seem deeply urgent and because for people who look like me, going to jail is not the end of the world. It's always the end of the world is the end of the world, you know, and, and hence one does what one can. Um, so, uh, uh, one, it's good to be hopeful, but you have to earn the hope, um, and and that's. I mean, I think that's where we are, and I feel like we've earned a certain amount of hope tonight just by kind of raising and talking about these questions, and the the actions, subsequent actions of the people in the audience who've been listening to us will determine whether that hope has, uh, you know, justification or not. Um, um, I look around at you all and I'm pretty convinced that you're already doing the right things and you're likely to continue doing them. Just amp it up some, please. So thank you very much. Mm.